All right, folks, welcome. Uh, I'm Eric Kolachek. I'm director of the Vary Institute, and I want to welcome you to our Did You Know series. Um, I'm going to give a quick intro to the series and also to our graduate student fellow host for today. Uh, and then she is going to take it away, uh, including introducing our speaker and giving a better sense as to uh, what the flow for today will be. Uh, so the Hurry Institute for Computing at BU, if you're not familiar with us, is dedicated to leading integrated initiatives in research and technology development, targeting a broad set of disciplines at the nexus of computational and data sciences. We have core strengths in cloud computing, security, data privacy, uh, AI, as well as a network of over 350 research affiliates uh, spanning the disciplines at BU. Uh, the Hurry Institute is positively impacting people everywhere. Here's our program for today. After my brief intro here, I'm going to turn it over to Hasini Warathunga. Uh, she's one of our graduate student fellows. She will introduce our speaker for today, Frank Gunther. He'll talk for about 20-ish minutes. Uh, the idea of this is to have sort of the spirit of brown bag lunch series. So it'll be a short talk followed by uh, a, a, an open period of discussion. So to give you a sense, if you haven't joined, been able to join us for these, uh, this year's series, we've had uh, myself talking about statistical principles. We had Mark Howard talk to us about training neural networks to model tasks, uh, and Maxwell Palmer talking about how car ownership could affect electoral patterns. This talk is, uh, this series in general is organized by our graduate student fellows, uh, and we're extremely grateful uh, to them for doing that for us. I also want to remind you that uh, you can watch these recordings if you haven't seen them on the Hurry Institute YouTube channel, uh, which we'll have a link to at the end there. All right, so then finally, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Hassini to you. She is uh, a PhD student in biomedical engineering here at Boston University. She's a graduate student in Dr. Kara Stepp's Sensor Motor Rehabilitation Engineering Lab. Her research is focused on characterizing speech motor control using sensor motor and kinematic measures, as well as neurocomputational modeling techniques. She received a BS in engineering from the University of Moratua in Sri, Sri Lanka, uh, where she majored in electronic and telecommunication engineering. So Hassini, all yours. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, so I, it's my great pleasure to host and introduce our feature speaker for today. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I want to uh, remind everyone to follow Harari Institute channels and get the latest updates on upcoming events. And this event today is being recorded and will be later on Harari Institute's YouTube channel for you to watch. I'd also like to know you can customize how you see subtitles by clicking the live transcript at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar and then selecting your preference. So with that logistics out of the way, I first wanna have a short icebreaker uh, to get to know the audience we have today. So my first question that I'm gonna uh, ask you to respond to in the Zoom chat is what is your field of study? So please uh, put a short answer in the Zoom chat so we know uh, who's joining with us today. Yes, so we have people from biomedical engineering, political science, uh, social work, astronomy, space physics, a lot of different fields, speech, language, and hearing sciences. Hi, Hillary. Yes. Um, so um, my next question is going to be a poll question. Uh, the question is, what degree of familiarity you have with speech motor control or brain motor uh, uh, brain computing interfaces in general. Uh, so if you have a little similarity, you've heard about these, or if you're very familiar, please let us know. And we'll give about a moment, um, 10, uh, 10 seconds or more. Yes, we have more people from speed science, yes. Uh, so there's a fair divide between people who are familiar with the topic and not. Uh, so this will be an interesting discussion for us uh, later on uh, from different degrees of familiarity. So before I end the uh, icebreaker round, I have one final question. Uh, what do you hope to gain from today's lightning talk? Uh, so put something in the chat uh, 
Do you want to know what's going on in the research in this field at the moment? Do you want to know if there's research opportunities in the field in BU and beyond? Uh, so let us know uh, what you hope to gain from today's presentation. I can also leave this question open for you to answer later, uh, and then we can discuss later on. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's uh, featured speaker because I have a short but interesting <laughs> so, uh, bio for him. So I hope this will only take five minutes, but I thought it was interesting to sort of talk about uh, uh, what Frank did early on so that it'll be inspirational for all of us. So Dr. Frank Gunther received a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Missouri in Columbia and a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from Princeton University and a PhD in Cognitive and Neural Systems from Boston University in 1993. Uh, Dr. Gunther joined a faculty in Cognitive and Neural Systems Department at Boston University right after, as I uh, read. Uh, in 2010, he became Associate Director of the Graduate Program of Neuroscience and Director of the Computational Neuroscience PhD Specialization at Boston University. He is also faculty and affiliated faculty in the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences and uh, Biomedical Engineering Department, respectively, in Boston University. Uh, in addition to his Boston University appointments, Dr. Gantha has many other affiliation, affiliations with uh, other institutes, such as the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, I know Dr. Gunther as the originator of Directions into Velocities of Articulators model, or the DIPA model, which is currently the leading model of the neural computations underlying speech production. Uh, DIVA model is the most anatomically grounded model of speech motor control and has been supported over data collected in behavioral and neuroimaging neuro studies over the past decade. Uh, the primary goal of Dr. Gunther's lab is the development, uh, testing, and refinement of a computational modeling framework addressing the neural processes underlying typical as well as disordered speech. So the main objective is to apply this theoretical framework to study communication disorders and design neural prosthetics in collaborative projects with other labs. Um, with regards to today's talk, why Dr. Gunther is our uh, featured speaker for today is that Dr. Gunther's team received widespread press coverage in 2009 when they developed a brain computer interface for real time speech synthesis that allowed locked in patient Eric Ramsey to produce wall sounds in collaboration with Dr. Philip Kennedy and Dr. Jonathan Bromberg. Uh, Dr. Gunther founded uh, the Unlock Project, a nonprofit project aimed at providing free brain computer interface technology to patients suffering from locked in syndrome. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Gunther with us today because he's someone who's given numerous keynotes and distinguished lectures worldwide and has authored over 55 refereed journal articles concerning the neural basis of speech motor control, as well as a brain computer interface technology. Um, you can check out his Wikipedia page where his research has been covered extensively in different science and popular media outlets such as television spots in CNN News to popular press coverage in BBC. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Frank Gunther. And the topic for today is, did you know you could use brain computer interfaces to restore speech? I would also, uh, so Frank, please go ahead and share your presentation. I'd like to remind the audience that you can use the Zoom chat window to ask any questions during the 20 minute presentation. We'll have extra 20 minutes at the end for Q&A where we can discuss things in detail. So thank you very much. And we are very excited to um, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Frank Gunther. Well, thank you, Hassini, for uh, such a nice introduction, and uh, thank you, Eric, and the rest of the Hariri Institute for inviting me here today. Um, as Hassini mentioned, uh, the part of our work that I'll be talking about today was done in collaboration with a number of people, uh, most notably Philip Kennedy of Neural Signals, Inc., who was the developer of the hardware system we use for the brain computer interface, as well as a number of people in my lab, including John Brumberg, Alfonso Nieto Castanon. Jason Tourville, uh, Misha Panko, and Rob Law. So I'm gonna start just by giving you a quick overview of just what a brain computer face uh, is. Um, basically a BCI as uh, we call them is a device that facilitates some interaction between neural activity in the brain and some computing device or uh, a computer that drives a, a piece of hardware. Um, so, uh, 
these go by a lot of other names. Uh, neural prosthesis is another common term that's used for this. And brain machine interface is a, a term. Uh, all of these uh, are uh, pretty much synonymous uh, uh, terms used to describe this sort of technology. Now, all of us have actually uh, probably heard of at least one very successful brain computer interface. Uh, and this is the cochlear implant. Uh, the cochlear implant is widely used today uh, in cases of sensory neural hearing loss. And it's what I would call an input BCI. So uh, this uh, BCI takes sound from the uh, uh, environment, transduces it into electrical signals, and then injects them into uh, nerve endings that are in the cochlea. Um, and so basically what it's doing is bypassing damaged uh, sensory cells in the cochlea and restoring hearing. And uh, uh, cochlear implants, although not perfect, uh, are uh, rather amazing in their ability to uh, uh, pro uh, provide enough uh, hearing to uh, in, uh, children, for example, if they're implanted young enough, that their speech is completely fluent uh, in adulthood. Uh, uh, there are very little uh, noticeable difference in their speech compared to neurotypical speech. Uh, so this uh, device uh, uh, has a profound uh, effect on, on those people. Um, the type of BCI I'll talk about today is actually uh, uh, the opposite sort, uh, which is an output BCI. And in this case, what happens is that uh, in somebody who has paralysis, uh, uh, typically uh, uh, you want to bypass damaged neural structures that are motor output structures rather than sensory input structures. And so what you do is typically decode brain activity, uh, most often from motor cortical areas uh, that are intact uh, with uh, uh, many forms of paralysis and decode that information into a signal that can be used to control a computer or a device connected to the computer. So here I'm showing a, a rough schematic of this. Can you see my cursor moving? Uh, Hassini, can you nod? Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, uh, so what's happening is uh, signals are measured uh, from the brain and they're very uh, different technologies and I'll, I'll very briefly go through a few here that can be used for this, but basically they all pull some neural activity from the brain that is digitized uh, and it's sent to a computer that does uh, feature extraction. So for example, pulling out spikes uh, from individual neurons and then decoding those uh, features into some sort of commands that drive a BCI application. And the application can be a computer cursor, for example. So uh, the person can uh, think about moving the cursor and, and have the cursor move on this computer screen. Uh, a robotic arm, I'll show an example of. Uh, or a speech synthesizer, which is the main topic of today's talk. Now, uh, the ways that we get the signals from the brain vary uh, uh, widely across studies. Uh, the, the least invasive uh, uh, are uh, EEG or electroencephalography signals. These are signals that are measured from the scalp via electrodes that are attached to the scalp temporarily. Uh, and uh, this has the advantage of being completely non-invasive uh, and safe. Uh, however, uh, the brain signals that are measured are very poor signal to noise ratio, very small electrical fields and terrible resolution, meaning that you're only receiving uh, one signal effectively from hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons even collectively firing together. You can't uh, uh, decode individual neurons, for example. Um, a step up in uh, uh, resolution and signal to noise ratio is electrocorticography. And in this case, uh, this is pretty much limited to people who are having brain uh, surgery, typically for epilepsy, where uh, a craniotomy is created. So a, a big part of the skull is removed and a, a array of electrodes that are similar to the EEG electrodes uh, are placed right on the scalp and, or sorry, right on the, uh, the cortex, right on the brain. And this provides much better signal uh, to noise ratio. The electrodes can be much closer together and much smaller, which gives us better resolution. So maybe now tens of thousands of neurons rather than millions. Um, uh, but it's still not the uh, ideal solution in that you still can't measure from uh, individual neurons. So uh, the most, uh, some of the most impressive uh, 
uh, BCIs to date have used instead microelectrodes. And in particular, uh, a common uh, setup here is to use what's called a Utah array. And here I have a, a large blown up picture of the array. Uh, it looks like basically a hundred needles that are quickly pushed into the cortex. The entire array is actually quite tiny. So here is the array on a fingertip. Um, and it's got a, wires coming off of it that go to a connector that's mounted uh, permanently on the, on the skull. And that connector can then uh, be connected to a computer uh, when the person goes into a lab uh, for the experiment. Um, so uh, this is uh, uh, the technology that probably has the most promise uh, for brain computer interfaces down the road, because with this type of electrode, you actually can pick up individual neurons. Uh, you can either pick up multi-neuron signals, which may be average from tens of neurons now compared to tens of thousands. Um, but you can even pick up uh, spikes from individual neurons. And so uh, these devices offer incredibly good uh, uh, spatial resolution in terms of uh, amount of cortex you're recording from. And so you can get very precise signals uh, with this sort of array. Now, uh, most of the work in uh, BCIs of this type have been done uh, uh, for one of two applications. One is controlling computer cursors and the other is controlling robotic arms. And just to give you a sense of where the field stands right now, I'm gonna show a demo here uh, from a, a 2008 paper by uh, Mel Valista and colleagues in which a monkey uh, uh, with a, I believe 100 uh, channel uh, uh, implant was uh, learned to control movements of this robotic arm. So here's the robotic arm. And what you're gonna see is that the, uh, the trainer or the experimenter is uh, going to use this thing to put, they'll put a marshmallow at the end of this and they'll move it somewhere in space. And the monkey's job is to reach, grab the thing and move the arm. And this monkey has been trained quite a lot, but you'll see that the monkey actually seems to be using the thing kind of like it's learned to use it as its own arm. Um, so uh, here's the demo. Uh, Uh, he can move it pretty much anywhere in the workspace. He's able to get the food, even brings it occasionally to lick the fingers of the, uh, uh, of the robotic arm. At this point, the monkey seems very uh, comfortable using the arm and is able to perform a uh, task that would be very useful for someone with uh, 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 severe paralysis. Um, this sort of demonstration has also been done uh, uh, with humans now in more recent papers. Um, to the point where now uh, in the lab, at least people can control robotic arms using just their thoughts. And all they're thinking about during this process is doing their tasks. So the monkey presumably is thinking of grabbing the marshmallow and pulling it to its mouth. He's not thinking about moving an elbow or anything like that. He's not thinking, uh, you know, any, he's not trying to move cursors or to get the job done. He's just doing naturally what he would do with his real arm and has learned over time to more or less replace this real arm uh, with a prosthetic arm that allows him to grab uh, food. Thanks, sorry to disturb. I think we went out of the presenter mode. Uh, if you can oh, bring it. Okay, to sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, okay, so next. All right, so the BCI that we developed in 2009 was the first uh, BCI that addressed rest restoration of speech. And in people who are uh, locked in, so in this study, we worked with uh, a patient who was suffering from locked in syndrome. This is someone who is fully conscious, but they can't move, basically. They can uh, move their eyes a little bit up and down to answer yes, no questions. And this is how we know the patient is conscious. Uh, we've also seen their brain activity while they attempt to do a picture naming task, and it looks like normal speech production activity in the brain. Um, but the person can't move at all and can't really uh, communicate except for very rudimentary uh, interactions. Um, and so the, a speech prosthesis would be life changing for somebody like this. And this is something that I hope to uh, uh, give you the uh, sense that it's a realistic thing to be happening and not uh, uh, too distant future where we can uh, develop a device where the person can simply think about talking and the device will uh, talk for them. Basically, a computer will, uh, with a synthesized voice, uh, create speech sounds. So in our case, the uh, implant was placed in what I'm gonna call speech motor cortex. It's a part of the motor cortex that 
uh, became most active when the patient tried to produce speech in the MRI scanner. Um, the electrode was placed there, and this electrode by modern standards is, is ancient. It was only three channels of, uh, uh, so three wires basically being recorded from. That information was sent wirelessly across the scalp in this case. That was possible because there were so few channels. Um, uh, and that meant that the, the subject had hair on his head, everything looked normal from the outside. Uh, and when he came in the lab, we would put an antenna that picked up radio signals that were being sent by the electronics that had been implanted under the scalp. And those radio signals were giving us the uh, electrical firing rates of the neurons. Uh, those were recorded and uh, decoded. Uh, we had a, a simple decoder that uh, uh, was trained by having the patient attempt to produce a, a series of vowels that we told him to produce. We knew what he was trying to say and we had the electrical signals. So we train up uh, a, a, a decoder, but we're only using about a minute of data. So the decoder is very rough. And what happens in this system is the patient uses it at first kind of awkwardly, but gets better and better and better over time, which I think is an important aspect of, uh, of this sort of BCI. Uh, the signals we were pulling off were called, uh, we were basically decoding intended formant frequencies. And you can just think of those as two or three dimensions that allow you to produce all the vowels by moving around. I'm gonna show a two, two dimensional display with the different vowels laid out on it one dimension is the first form and frequency and the other is the second form and frequency. And you'll be able to see and hear the, the movements inside that space. Uh, so after the uh, brief training period, we then uh, gave the uh, patient a number of words to uh, our vowel to vowel sequences to attempt to say. So they would be something like, uh, you'll hear the computer say, listen, uh, e speak. And then you'll hear the output of the VCI while the person is trying to repeat what he had just heard. Um, and all he's trying to do is say those words. He's just trying hard to say them. He can't move, so no sound is coming out, but his motor cortex is active uh, because the damage was in his brainstem far below the motor cortex and the output pathways. And so there was still uh, reliable uh, information in the motor cortex that told us what he was trying to say in effect. Importantly in this system, the decoder is very fast. So we can go from the firing rates in his brain to a, the corresponding sound output in 50 milliseconds, which 1 20th of a second. And that's roughly the, the time it takes in your brain for your motor cortex to drive uh, sound output. And so it's a very natural delay, which makes it possible for the person to use the device because it seems as though to them when they're trying to say it, it's as if this is their vocal tract moving and they're getting feedback in real time, just like our speech system has evolved to uh, 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 utilize. So uh, what I'm gonna show in the next uh, few slides. So on the left is a very low grainy resolution kind of underground video of the setup in the lab that we were working on. And uh, what you see here, this is the patient, the locked in patient in his uh, uh, chair, wheelchair. Uh, he's uh, uh, got uh, a cap on that's got the in, uh, antenna in it that's measuring the signals that goes to his computer setup that's over here. This is the experimenter. This is a, a reporter that was at, at this session. And what you'll hear is the computer uh, during the experiment will tell the, uh, the person, listen, uh, E, and, it, uh, and in this two-dimensional thing, uh, is in the center always, and E is in the upper left corner in this case. So. Uh, there'll be a cursor and the goal of the uh, uh, patient is to move that cursor into the E, but he doesn't need to see this. We're, this is just for us uh, to visualize what's happening. He's doing it all from hearing the signal that's coming out of the computer in real time based on his brain signals. So uh, here's kind of what it looks like in the lab and then I'll show you a cleaned up version of, of what you just saw. Listen. So the, after the speak, that's him set, uh, talking with a prosthesis. Uh, speak. Uh, and so I'll stop this and move on to. Uh, sorry, started up. 
So what I'm just going to show you is just a cleaned up version of that uh, video so you can see better what's happening. And pay attention to the trajectory of this circle because uh, when we speak, we may basically make straight lines in this space. And what you'll see is that sometimes he's able to do that, but other times he'll go off and he'll steer in over time because he can hear he's not doing the right thing. He's kind of trying to move his mouth, uh, uh, it, which isn't moving, but uh, the uh, neurons that drive it are move changing. And that'll allow him to kind of steer it up toward the right target. Uh, speak. Uh, so there he did a very direct hit. That's kind of pretty normal. Uh, speak. Uh, Here he goes off in the wrong direction, but corrects it once he hears it. Uh, speak. Uh, listen. Another direct hit there. Uh, speak. Uh, Here he goes way off and doesn't quite have enough time to make it to the target, so this would be a fail. Listen. And then the final one again, he has a nice direct hit. Speak. Uh, now, uh, this is clearly not uh, good enough sound output uh, 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 for producing full words and sentences yet, uh, but uh, keep in mind here that this is a three channel uh, system. So there are only three electrode wires as opposed to new systems that have a hundred wires. Uh, and uh, uh, the production rate uh, is also uh, can be, so there are a number of ways to improve the system. Um, but the point being here, what we're seeing is that not only can he kind of use it to begin with, but he gets better and better with practice. And so this gives the hope that if the person can just practice with this for days and days and days, for example, in a permanent uh, BCI, that they'll get very good at using it, just like we get good, or people who have amputations get good at controlling their uh, prosthetic limbs. Um, but uh, the I'm reason- to disturb Frank again to your presenter. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> The reason uh, that uh, he was able to learn over the course of a ses session, so what I'm showing here is basically his error uh, measured in sound space uh, from the different quarter quarters of a session. So the first quarter to the last quarter, and we see there's a very steady decrease in error over the course of this. And this is because his brain is able to adapt because we provide him with auditory feedback in real time. And this allows him to do two important things. One, he can correct his errors in real time. And secondly, and more importantly, he can change the brain uh, connections so that the next time he has to produce a, a word, he's, his system's a bit more tuned than it was in the prior time. And this is why we see continued improvement over the course of the session. So uh, I'm gonna leave you with one last uh, uh, slide uh, describing an alternative approach. So the approach I just described was completely based on real-time feedback. There's a very different approach that's been used by uh, people like Eddie Chang and colleagues at UCF SAP. And in this approach, basically what you do is you just record days and days and days of the person speaking. So you have many, many examples of many words and sentences and just record a, a, a then after that, you record a snippet of, of brain activity over a second or two and match that to uh, the best matching uh, word and in these cases, you can get actually very good uh, sound output. Um, but one major outstanding question, which is kind of food for thought, maybe we can discuss, is, is that approach the best approach in the long run, uh, this brute force approach, or is an approach that allows the person to use the thing and get better and better and better through real-time feedback, a better approach? And I'll leave it there uh, to keep this somewhere near the lightning uh, uh, length for a lightning talk. <laughs> Um, thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, uh, I, I, I have, uh, so from here onwards, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to uh, open the flow for uh, all the participants to ask any questions you have. This is a very interesting talk. Uh, this is part of the research that I myself don't see often uh, or discuss with Dr. Gunther. So I have some questions on my own as well. Uh, so until, uh, if you have any questions, you can raise your, use the raise hand option or unmute yourself and just speak. Uh, until questions uh, come around, I'll ask the first question. 
so I know there's a modeling basis of modeling framework that you're developing for speech motor control that's been ongoing for a decade or more. And then there's this uh, neural processes approach that's ongoing, maybe more based on like pattern recognition or, you know, there's a black box in between. Uh, and on the other side, in, in the modeling framework, you're trying to decode what's there in the black box. Uh, so my question is, uh, how much of the information that you learn from the modeling uh, does help you in the BCI or in the future can help in the BCI world, uh, you know, you know, get away from the black box approach and, you know, uh, have add more information in there? That's a great uh, question. And so I, I would, so we have a model that talks about that explicitly uh, describes with equations how it's a neural network model that, that has components that correspond to the different parts of the brain involved in speech. And one of those is the area where the brain, uh, where the electrode was implanted. And our model gave us two, I think, a couple of uh, crucial insights. The first insight was that in our model, that part of the brain is basically coding auditory trajectories. So kind of like movements in that auditory space. That's what we think that part of the brain uh, does to plan speech. And so that suggested that rather than try to pull out jaw position and all the other speech articulators, which is very complex, as, as you know, Hassini, that uh, we have a hundred muscles or more that are involved in speaking and trying to decode all of those is impossible uh, uh, with the limited amount of time and limited number of electrodes we have. But we can instead go directly to the sound signal. And in fact, our model says that that should be easier to, to pull out of this area than individual articulator positions. So that led us to use this synthesizer approach where we just decoded this relatively low dimensional form and frequency space. So we are only decoding three variables or two variables, depending on uh, the study. And those variables uh, alone, if you can learn to control them well, are enough to produce a, a lot of speech. Uh, so that was one. And the other uh, thing that uh, we know from our model is our model addresses how an infant learns to produce speech. So uh, every infant uh, has to be uh, capable of learning any one of the world's languages. You never know what, <laughs> as an infant, you never know where you're going to pop out. And so you might end up uh, in uh, a place that speaks one language or another. So you have to be able to hear the language around you and also move your articulators uh, to produce the sounds that are around you. And that differs widely from uh, place to place. We don't even pay attention to the same sound signals uh, even in some languages. Uh, but uh, we've mapped out how that happens in the brain uh, by uh, uh, doing experiments and incorporating the results into our model. So we have a good idea of where the parts of the brain are that are important for learning uh, a new language, uh, learning to produce these speech sounds and how they do it, what kind of information they need. And what we uh, know from the model is that uh, we go through some, uh, uh, what's called an action perception cycle to tune our brains up. So we speak sounds, we hear them and we, so we're back. So when an infant babbles, they're kind of randomly moving their speech articulators but they're learning very much about the relationship between sound and uh, uh, movements so that they can later make the correct movements in order to produce a desired sound to follow the sounds of the language. And so what they need for that is auditory feedback that's real time while they're speaking, they need to hear, and that allows them to tune their system up to map basically desired auditory trajectories into motor commands. Um, and so we believed that if we gave real-time feedback, even if the system didn't work very well initially, based on our model, we thought, well, he'll be able to improve performance with practice because the more you uh, 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 hear yourself while you're trying to move uh, your articulators, the better your mapping will be and the, uh, the better the, the prosthesis work. And so one of the more exciting things, well, two exciting things happened for us outside of the prosthesis world. And those were things where we verified first, you can pull out formant frequencies from premotor cortex, which was a novel uh, prediction of our model. And as the model suggested, even in this situation where the person's not actually moving, their brain should be capable of using an external device 
to create a sound and they should improve with practice with that as long as we give them real time feedback. So it was very important that we didn't have a 500 millisecond or one second delay, but instead had a 50 millisecond delay, which is the delay that your brain expects when trying to associate auditory uh, signals to your self-produced actions. Awesome, thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm again gonna ask the audience if there's any questions, you can either put it in the chat or ask uh, yourself by unmuting yourself. I'll ask a question. <clears throat> so um, this is about the, the ECOG-based ECI that you mentioned at the end. Yep. I was wondering what the limitation of that is. Like, um, I assume that there's many, many words, at least in English, that sound similar. And I, I'm wondering if like the, the ECOG patterns you see are also similar in those words. And so maybe it's difficult to decode certain words. I mean, it is difficult and it's taken a long time to get to the point uh, where this group is. Uh, and they've spent a tremendous amount of effort putting, uh, uh, using the latest machine learning techniques, et cetera, uh, in order to pull this signal out. And one of the drawbacks though, is that they have to record from many, many sessions over time. And so they uh, can train the system up to produce all those words. Uh, it remains to be seen how accurate uh, 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 it will be, you know, at plateau when the, the system's uh, as good as it's going to get. Uh, but I will say that they've had some pretty uh, impressive demonstrations that make me think that it may be possible. I didn't originally think ECOG would have enough uh, uh, information uh, in the signals, but it, they, their success has made me rethink that and maybe, maybe it will be. Uh, good enough. I think there are uh, other uh, shortcomings. One is the the unnaturalness of the way the the system works. So the way the system works uh, would be that uh, a word is typed up on the screen, and the person's supposed to say the word, and so they're trying to say it, and the computer's sitting there silently for a second or two until it figures out what they're trying to say, and then it pops up the text for the word on the screen. And then they leverage uh, language models to predict what word's going to be next, et cetera. And that helps eliminate some of the ambiguities that you mentioned. So if two words have very similar patterns, but only one of them makes any sense at all in this sentence, the language model will pick the right one. And our brains kind of do that anyway. Uh, you'd be surprised at how much of the speech signal you can extract and still understand the speech if it's a regular sentence that's being spoken. Uh, so. There's a lot of promise in that. The, uh, the shortcomings, I think the biggest shortcoming in the long run will be that the system really isn't set up to improve with practice and the feedback's not the right kind of feedback for your speech parts of your brain to improve with practice. So I think it, it's not quite as natural as a prosthesis that is in real time decoding the sounds. I believe that will be the approach that in the end, you know, decades from now, it will be the most commonly used approach. Um, but both of them show promise. And I think the ECOG approach shows more immediate promise, mainly because much more effort has gone into that. Uh, uh, one of the issues is that only one person has ever had microelectrodes implanted in the speech motor cortex to date. And that was the patient we worked with. And I've tried to get uh, some groups that work on BCIs for arm movements to consider implanting the speech areas, but they they just have so much going on already that they're sticking with the arm area. They got appro approval for that from the FDA, et cetera. They're trying to make a product. And they have done some work showing that you can actually get some speech information even from the hand area, which is uh, uh, interesting. Uh, but I think in the end, electrodes will need to go into the speech area uh, and uh, do something along the lines of what we did, but more sophisticated uh, to produce a really natural, uh, ideal uh, speech BCI. Can I ask a quick follow up on that? Sure. Um, sure. So it seems like uh, you know you're looking at you're looking at ECOG and you're looking at the EEG, and as you said, you know one's invasive and one's non-invasive. The context that you demonstrated in seems like it's in a, in a far extreme case in the spectrum of, uh, of the extent to which someone can be speech challenged. 
is there do you have a could you sketch to any extent you have a sense as to kind of how these two spectra meet right because you have sort of invasive to non-invasive and then you have kind of extreme to mild is there a is there a, a, a spot in the middle where ecog could perhaps be sufficiently good for uh sufficiently mild challenges so, well so first eeg which is the only non-invasive one oh, sorry. is relatively terrible <laughs> it, okay. it, like the the prostheses that people use uh, uh for speech for with eeg all involve doing something very unnatural like think about moving your left hand to make the cursor move on a typewriter this way and think about moving your right hand and the problem is that you know left and right we can resolve with eeg because they're very far apart but a versus Z is invisible in EEG. Like those, uh, 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 you just can't get that kind of resolution. So I don't think EEG will lead to a any sort of real-time device like this that's helpful. Um, uh, and in fact, the way the most common use of EEG now is what's called the P300 speller, where they flash letters on the screen. And if you're paying attention to the letter you want, you want, your visual cortex has a P300 event that can be measured. And by measuring those over about 10 seconds, you can pull out one letter. And so it's just not uh, a feasible long-term solution. So I believe you're gonna have to have invasive uh, 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 solutions. I would say that ECOG is at least as invasive as these microelectrodes, mainly because you have to make a much bigger craniotomy uh, for ECOG and it's not the point pushing stuff into the cortex that's so problematic. It's the craniotomy and the uh, potential for uh, 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 having health issues, uh, uh, healing issues, et cetera. Uh, so by, once you're in there, you might, if you are going to put ECOG in for a permanent device, I, I believe that people will start putting both ECOG and microelectrodes simultaneously in there. Uh, so you might have a, in the speech motor cortex, you might have a hundred channel array like a, the one I showed, but you might also have a large ECOG array that covers your whole left hemisphere. Um, uh, with ECOG, they tend to use much more of the brain for decoding than you would uh, uh, with a microelectrode because a microelectrode, of course, only gets information from a small area and an array, it's still a pretty small area. But uh, an ECOG array can measure uh, vast parts of the brain and there's utility to getting information from different parts of the brain. So there's a trade-off, it's lower resolution and it's not nearly the precise information about speech movements, but it may give you a lot of other important information like context or maybe it helps with sentence decoding, et cetera. So I think there'll be hybrid systems that combine those two technologies in the not too distant future. So the extent to which it'll go to uh, uh, more commercial oriented or more general uh, settings is, is going to be band limited by uh, the extent to which you can improve on the non the quality of non invasive. Right, and and the biggest single issue stopping these things, I think, from being out in the real world, is the connector that comes out of the head. So that connector is the source of infections eventually and that's terrible so that's what you need to avoid and so uh we had a wireless system as i mentioned but it was very low channel capacity which meant it was very low power etc there's a lot of work going on now into much higher uh so they have 100 channel wireless systems now that are quite low power that's getting close to the point where i think i mean they're testing it in monkeys they'll be testing in humans before too long uh, but that's when I think you'll start seeing, uh, 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 you know, them actually being used in the world. That's, to, in my mind, probably the the number one problem. So the ECOC, so for example, the the Chang system, if you had a wireless connector on that, uh, uh, that I think people might actually use it as is. Uh, it, uh, locked in people uh, uh, might, uh, but uh, I don't know how much. So, given that you have to go into the brain. It's only going to be for severe cases that that this will be used. This sort of uh, technology, I think. I don't think it. It's really not geared for people who have lesser issues that might be solved with some non-invasive uh, approach.
Awesome. Uh, so there's one uh, one more question in the chat uh, with from Megan. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? I could see the question. If, yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Um, Megan, are you going to ask the question? <laughs> it's up to you. I, I was just, um, I'm a first year student in the graduate program for neuroscience, and um, I'm currently doing lab rotations, and I'm just very interested in your research um, and BCIs in general, and yeah. um, was wondering if your lab was currently taking rotation students. Uh, we do take rotation students. We're not really doing much BCI work anymore. So, uh, as I may have mentioned, the uh, electrodes we were using, they're no, I may have not have mentioned, they're no longer in use, basically, and the, the person retired, Phil Kennedy, that we were working with. So right now we don't have any projects that involve decoding uh, from speech, and, and we've kind of quit doing EEG-based uh, uh, BCIs because they're not really getting at the science questions about speech that we're interested in. Um, but we do have several projects that involve recordings and trying to pull information out from recordings. Uh, one involves people who are undergoing uh, deep brain stimulation surgery. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, recordings are being done both from ECOG strip and microelectrodes in the basal ganglia. And uh, we're, uh, we're uh, collaborating with a group at Mass General Hospital led by Mark Richardson, and they're collecting uh, uh, data during speech tasks that we have specifically chosen to try to get at some questions related to basal ganglia function during speech, for example. And then we have other projects that are purely ECOG, uh, looking at decoding uh, uh, ECOG information, like what kind of information can we get uh, out of ECOG signals about the different mechanisms of speech. Uh, and then finally, we do a lot of functional MRI, which is a, a very different kind of measure. It's totally non-invasive, which is the mm -hmm the great thing and it, it's pretty high resolution but unfortunately the time course uh the time resolution is terrible so if with fmri you can measure brain activity on the order of seconds maybe whereas you need millisecond by millisecond precision to do something like a speech uh, bci in real time so there are opportunities if you're interested in, in those sorts of things we're not directly working on uh, brain computer interfaces um, and we're less focused on the machine. We're interested in using machine learning and we do learn, use it uh, in uh, some of our studies, uh, but our focus is generally pulling out as much information about what the brain is doing during speech as possible from, from these uh, measurements. That's uh, our, our main focus. Great, that sounds very interesting. So, so I'll, I'll definitely reach out to you. Great. Thank you. Sure. Awesome, our next question is by Anne, Anne, go ahead. Thank you uh, for, for this great talk. I was wondering about the personalization of this type of PCI device and how, so you said that there was a training uh, on yeah. the side of the participants. And I was wondering if you also have a sort of training of the decoder to, to personalize it to the, this participant's neural activity or if it's, yeah, yeah. How, how the personalization happens. So it, the decoder itself is is completely specific to the individual. And mm -hmm. the reason for that is that even if our brains were identical, which they are not, um, it, if you uh, put the electrodes in slightly different place in one person, you're getting completely different neurons. But more importantly, our brains aren't identical. So you don't really know which neurons you're, you know, you can do an MRI, uh, fMRI in advance and find out which you know, area is the best bet for speech activity uh, and put the electrodes there, but you don't know what the electrode, each, any single uh, uh, neuron represents yet. So you have to have some training uh, process. Ours was very simple. It was just a, uh, uh, the, the person just said, uh, e, uh, e, over and over. We told them exactly what to say. We know what the format frequencies are over time for that. And that, that we just trained a very simple linear decoder to go from the neural signals to the predicted format frequencies. Um, but one very nice thing about this approach is the initial decoder is never very good, but they get better and better with using it. And yeah. so even though the decoder's poor at first, the person's brain is adapting to use it as if it's a new you know, limb or vocal tract in our case. Uh, and that I think is crucial to them uh, attaining very high performance levels. Um, but related to this, it doesn't just have to be the person's brain that's learning. 
the decoder can also do some learning. And we've looked at adaptive decoding techniques a little bit. And I'm, you know, I'm interested in that. And I'm sure that down the road, those things are gonna be important. Another reason that might be important is because these arrays slowly drift. Uh, so from day to day, you're not getting the same, they're not really moving much physically, but the neurons that they're recording from is changing slightly from day to day. And so you kind of continuously have to keep this thing tuned up. And I think that that, that can happen by, uh, you know, having the system, uh, know, you know, mod, it knows what it's trying to say, perhaps, like there are ways to have that happen during real time, but one, way would be for the decoder, for an adaptive decoder to basically attempt to maintain stability over time by adjusting how it weights the different neurons, et cetera. Um, so I think there's a, you know, not only does it have to be very personalized to begin with, but uh, it has to continually adapt to changes. changes in that person's brain and changes in the, uh, uh, you know, position, exact position of the electrodes. Um, it's tricky though, because if it changes too quickly, then it becomes unusable uh, as well. So uh, these are things that, these are active research areas. Uh, uh, and I think they're very promising for improving the reliability of these things from day to day. A typical experiment with one of these things in, in most labs, you start out by training a new decoder that morning, and then you run the experiment with that decoder because you can't trust the, dec the decoder from the day before is still good. We did some kind of uh, qualitative comparisons, and we sometimes you would see uh, the, pretty much the decoders similar for two days, but then suddenly it completely changed. And, wow. and and our electrodes were extremely well implanted. They were they're called neurotrophic electrodes. They were actually locked into the brain by the growth of axons into the electro body. So they were not moving. It's just that the signals drift from day to day, and uh, you're, you know, a single neuron isn't a very reliable thing. You need a hundred neurons that all do similar things to get a kind of reliable signal through averaging, because the, the exact activity pattern in the brain uh, is more variable than than you might expect. Fascinating. <laughs> Thank you very much for answer. Sure. All right, we have time for one or, more, one or two more questions. So if you want to go ahead, uh, please do so now. I'll ask another question. Um, yeah. I'm kind of just curious about what the what other functions the speech motor cortex has. Uh, obviously, I guess it is uh, helpful for planning what you want to say, but is there anything else that we know about it? So the, the parts of the motor cortex that control speech actually are the same parts that control any individual articulator movement. So, uh, you know, if you just chew gum, that the speech area lights up because you're using your jaw and your uh, tongue. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's used to control all of the vocal tract articulators for any sort of conscious movement. Um, but... Uh, but what is happening, we think, and this we know from fMRI, that if you look at fMRI studies of individual articulators, it covers almost the entire motor cortex that you see active during speech. What I think is happening is that if it's the same neurons that control the output you know, that, to the muscles, but they're connected up in a different way for speech. So it's a neural network and the, the synaptic connections all between that network uh, are, are what kind of uh, form the unit that, that produces a, a particular task. So speech uses one kind of connectivity pattern uh, across that network. Individual articulator movements uh, use simpler movements, or, uh, uh, you know, simpler networks most likely. Um, but uh, that part of the motor cortex, pri the primary motor cortex is tied to the speech articulator. So it's pretty much involved in any articulator movement that's uh, volitional. If you go a little farther forward, and, and our electrodes kind of span premotor and primary motor cortex, premotor cortex is more abstract. And so I think amongst other things, besides you know, motor representations, you'll see, first we showed that there's auditory representation there. So it's representing sounds that you're attempting to produce at least. And there are probably starting to be things like phonological representations, because you're starting to get up into the language system once you go to premotor cortex. And so 
uh, I suspect that premotor cortex for speech is doing phonological processing of some sort, like taking words and breaking them into uh, phoneme size or syllable size chunks and feeding them to the primary motor cortex for production. Cool, thank you. Awesome. So uh, I'm afraid we're running out of time for today's talk to ask any more questions, but feel free to check out Dr. Gant's lab. There's a lot of information in Gant's lab website that I even I didn't realize earlier. That's <laughs> a lot about uh, each of these different topics that he talked about. Um, so today's talk is going to also be in YouTube uh, if you want to like go back and refer to it. Uh, I just want to thank Dr. Gunther for um, saying yes to giving a talk at Harari Institute. Uh, did you know you could series? I, I hope you all learned a lot and it was a fascinating topic to talk. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Gunther, for uh, your My time. pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks for the good questions. Awesome. So I think that's the end of the spring series of Did You Know You Could? So we don't have any other seri uh, series topics coming up until summer or fall, uh, but we'll reach out uh, through the channels uh, to what that'll be. So thank you so much for everyone for joining and we hope you all have a wonderful day.